Hey everybody, it's Fellow Gamer Junkie, and I welcome you back to my channel. So right now, I'm going to be re reading Chapter Two of the Assassin's Creed Odyssey novel. Let's get started. Despite the promised warmth and soft bed, she slept not a moment, troubled by the task that laid ahead. She st she stared at the head of her lamp, propped near the bed, illuminated by a shaft of moonlight for what felt like hours before deciding to rise while it was still dark. Phoebe pressed against her, did not stir. She kissed the girl's head before swinging her legs off the bed, dressing and slipping away from the vineyard and out into the night chill countryside. She stayed close to the western shoreline in the pre-dawn gloom. She heard wild cats hissing and yowling and kept one hand on her hunting bow as she went. The sun soon breached the horizon and spread its fiery wings across the island, combing across the hills and meadows. On one high point, she saw the neighbouring island of Ithaca, weltering in the rising heat. The remains of the ancient palace of Odysseus stood on a hillside there, fingers of light streaking through that ghastly ruin. She gazed at the crumbling edifice as she always did, and who could not? It was a wistful monument to a long-dead hero, an adventurer who had travelled across the world and back, fighting in a great war with his wits as well as his weapons. She glanced around the brushland of Cephalonia with a renewed disdain. Stop dreaming, I will never get off this damned island. Here I live and here I will die. <sighs> I'm a little bit tired on the bed late today, Phoebe, in case you're wondering why I was yawning. <laughs> Not because the book's boring. No, no, I'm enjoying it. On she went, and soon she came to the root of a rugged western penins peninsula that struck out into the sea like a fawn. She crouched there like a hunter, sipping her sipping her water. The the sea the cicada the c i c a d a that's the word I'm going to call it cicada. The cicada song growing in intensity. Like the heat as she studied the land, the cyclops hideout sat. Uh, the cyclops is, uh, oh, and again, the cyclops's hideout sat upon a flat top natural mound, roughly half a mile ahead near the peninsula's tip. The sprawling compound was a was a hideout in name only, for the cyclops did not need to hide from anyone. A low wall closed off the estate, grass and pink geranius sprouting from the cracks in the on the withered stone walk. Within a villa stood crowd roofed with terracotta tiles, a pale marble facade and Doric columns painted in orc in orcry and sea blue. She counted six of his hired thugs upon the outer walls, walking back and forth along the crude parapets, watching the countryside. Two men stood statue still outside the eastern gatehouse, and she could see a similar gateway on the northern wall too. Worse, Cassandra realized the ground that lay between her and the estate wall offered little cover for her approach. Just a few cypress trees and olive stands, but mostly low, thin brush and four more men strolled to and fro across this open ground. Where, um, what was I? Okay, I blink my eyes, I lost my spot. Um, to and fro, here we go. Wearing wide-brimmed hats to shield their eyes from the sun, watching for any movement and all in plain sight of each other, and the men on the walls. Th these outlying watchmen were effectively a border, sealing off this spawn of land as if it were, as if it were the Cyclops' own country. No way though, there is always a way, Nicholas Spat. As Toshi looked north down the bush and rock slopes leading to the shore. The blue the the deep blue waters lapped gently upon the thin strip of shingle down there. One edge of her lips flickered in loathing acceptance as she realized that Nicholas was right. Thumbing the cork of her water skin, she tipped it upside down and let the precious water trickle away down into the parched golden earth. Keeping low and watching the closest of the four outlying centuries, 
She picked her way carefully down to the shore. Then she wrapped her spear and bow in oiled leather and strapped both across her back before wading into the bracing shallows. When the water when the waters rose to her breast, she launched herself prone, stretching out with her arms, kicking back of her legs to corkscrew through the water. Westwards along the peninsula's coastline and towards its tip, weeds and tiny fish stroked and brushed at her legs and belly until she was out in the deeper sections with every second stroke of her arms. She glanced up at the shoreline on her left, no sign of the nearest outlier. Suddenly, dolphins left and chattered out in the deeper waters. She heard the scrap of boots of the shore and saw the tip of a wide brimmed hat coming to investigate. With a full breath, she plunged under the surface through the undulating blue. She saw the dolphins speeding along like her. Looking towards the shore, she saw the shins of the guard wading in the shallows for a better look. Up through the water surface, she saw the distorted outline of the man. The ship of his spear held across his chest, but he wadded no further than knee deep. He held. He had seen nothing but dolphins at play, and he seemed quite happy to stand there and bask in the sunlight. All while the all while the breath in Cassandra's lungs grew stale and then fiery. If she surfaced now, she was as good as dead. If she did not, the same fate awaited. Black spot burst and spread around the edges of her vision as, she, as the spent breath escaped from her lips in a flurry of bubbles like rats fleeing in a sinking skiff. The cold hand of panic tried to seize her, yet calmly she took her thumb from her mouth of her air-filled drinking skin, sucked in a deep and full breath, and swam on, revitalized. She had watched her from afar, seeing how she had taken the time to judge her approach to the Cyclops' den. Now he watched her surface gracefully, just downhill from the peninsula's tip and the estate's northern gateway, and not too far from its vantage point either. So far, she was living up to her reputation, and soon we will see if she is as skilled and deadly as they claim, mused the Watcher, folding his arms and letting a grin rise across his face. <coughs> Cassandra levered herself from the water and onto a flat sun warmed shelf of stone. She picked her way up the rocky hinterland, keeping low behind bushes as she went. Within a stretch of a hundred strides or so, she was almost dry from the sun nearing the estate's northern walls. She settled down behind a boulder that peeked up to pick it up to go to gouge the two guards flanking the gateway. G-A-U-G-E, I'm pretty sure that's gouge. They wore leather corselets and one sported a red headband. One gripped a good spear diagonally across his chest and the other carried a small axe on his belt. Through, through the gate she saw no movement around the villa itself, none patrolling the, none patrolling the rooftop terrace or standing at the entrance. Festival. The Cyclops had taken most of his men with him. She realized the outer walls were the key. If she could slip by the watch here, she would be in. T she would be into the unguarded in interior. These these uh, these gate sentries had to be dealt with, but how to do so without alerting a dozen or so of us strolling the para Pets. A gentle shuffling sounded right beside her, and her heart almost slipped from her mouth in fright. Icarus, by all the gods, she hissed. Icarus gave her a hood-eyed look, then lurched up into flight. Cassandra ducked down, one eye peeking over the boulder to see if a spotted eagle glide towards the gate. The two sentries didn't notice until he was close, and with a flap of his wings he sped up. Over the head of one guard, talons extended to snatch the red headband. Malacus, the guard yelped, grabbing at his own scalp and howling at the bird as it sped on inside the estate. The pair lumbered inside after Icarus. 
few of the men on top of the wall laughed and heckled as they watched the spectacle. Let's get rid of this thing that popped up on my laptop. There we, there we go. Cassandra's eyes stayed on the backs of the distracted two as she rose and sped low. Cat soft on her feet just as she slipped through the gateway. The pair gave up their chase of Icarus and turned back towards her as if caught by the swing of an invisible boxer. Cassandra threw herself to the right and from their line of sight, landing in a tangle of wild gorse sprouting near the base of the walls. The bush settled and she held a burning breath in her lungs, watching through the undergrowth as the two guards walked right past her and back to their places at the gateway. The other men on the walls turned the face outwards too. She was inside, unseen. Heart thumping, she rolled her eyes towards the villa. The main entrance beckoned like a shady maw, the twin red pillars flanking it like bloody fangs. She picked her way across the compound, ducking behind wagons, strewn, strewn barrels, piled hay, and wooden out, and wooden, what's that word? Oh shit, I just lost my voice again. Um, wooden outhouses, until she was a short arrow shot away. Her legs shook primed to, prime to sprint inside. It was only bitter experience that chained her there on her haunches. Can't see a damn thing in there, she mused. There must be a dozen of the Cyclops' men standing in those shadows. She looked up instead. The roof parent sported a doorway in, into the upper floor, creeping forward. She seized an, uh, an ivy vine and walked herself up the villa wall. A foot slipped, kicking a terracotta tile on the porch roof. The tile cracked and slid, spinning away towards the ground. Cassandra let go of the vine with one hand and caught the tile, exhaling in relief. Stealth, Nicholas hissed in her head. A Spartan must be nimble and silent like a shade. I am not a Spartan, I am an outcast. She growled to chase the voice away, then hopped up over the marble balustrade. The arched doorway leading into the villa's upper floor was just as shady as the main entrance. Sucking in a deep breath, she edged inside, one hand poised near her spear haft, the other extended for balance. Should she need to roll or leap clear of an attack, for a moment she was blinded by the darkness. Her head flickering in every direction and her braided tail lashing like a whip. In, in her mind's eye she saw grim-faced sentries rushing her, silvery blades chopping down, and then her eyes adjusted and she saw just a quiet deserted bedchamber. The pale washed walls were licked with bright paint depicting a scene of battle, with a one-eyed champion trumping over, triumphing over many smaller foes. A grand bed laid at one end of the room, laden with plush silk blankets. Nothing in here, she decided, until she turned round and saw the plinth of Parian marble by the chamber. Her, the trophies resting upon it chilled her to the marrow. Three desiccated heads mounted on a wooden, mounted on wooden stands like prize battle helms. Sandra paced over towards them, guardedly as if they might sprout bodies and attack her, but these three were long dead. One a bad-toothed man with long hair had clearly died in pain, judging by the death Riticus fixed on his face. The next was a young lad who had, had, who had had his nose sworn off to leave a ragged mess at the center of his now peaceful face. The third middle-aged woman was locked in a sightless scream, mouth ajar as if crying out behind you. A floorboard groaned. Cassandra spun around, part drawn, drawing her spear, right lashing her like a tongue of fire. Nothing. Her, her heart thundered against her ribs. Had the noise been her imagination? She returned her spear to her belt and fl flicked a glance back at the heads. None of them was Scamandrios, she was certain. Perhaps the weasel had stolen whatever he was after and escaped. Fled to the north to live the life of a rich man. The four instilled a bravado in her and she crept to the bedchamber doorway with a degree of confidence, edging her head 
her head out into onto the landing to look around. She saw nothing to the left, nothing to the right, and then straight ahead, two guards. She she went for a spear again, only to realize the guards were in fact agency of Zavama. Bronze cu cuirasses, helms, and greaves, probably robbed from the ruins of the old palace on Ithaca. Webs had gathered inside the helms like sagging faces, scowling. She paced across the landing, eyeing the two doors ahead. One was surely the Cyclops' strong room. Most on the island said he slept on his goal, but this was the next closest thing. Edging to the leftmost door, she twisted the handle slowly. With a clug, it released and the door wide as it floated open. The noise sent a thousand cold-footed rats scampering through Cassandra's guts. She held her breath for a moment, but nobody outside heard the noise. The leaves. She peered into the room. Nothing. Just stark stone walls, unpainted or plastered, and a plain wooden floor. <coughs> Not a jot of furniture except for a shabby old cupboard on the right-hand wall. Its doors were missing and it was empty. Stepping to her right, she gently turned the handle of the second door. It opened slightly to, review, to reveal a vision of gold. A finger of sunlight shone, shone in through a narrow oculus in the ceiling. Dust motes floated lazily in the glint light, illuminating a trove of plunder, ivory chests of coin and charms, a bench laid out with silver cir circlets, tokens and cups to a shelf uh, be decked with lapis lazul lazuli stones of the most memorizing blue. <laughs> Opals, sardonyx, emeralds, necklaces of amethyst bead, beads, and an ornamental war bowl chased with electrum, and there to the rear of the chamber, just where the shaft of sunlight became dark, became dark shadow again, sat the eye. She licked her dry lips. It rested on the cedar wood plinth, fixed so as to stare at her with its golden pupil. This was the greatest treasure of them all, more valuable than a pocket full or, e or even a sack full of coins or gems. All she had to do was step across the room past the other riches and take it. Take it. She took a step forward and halted. It was the slightest of sensations that stopped her. A smell of something incongruous behind the odor of metal and polish, a scent of death, decay. Her eyes rolled left and right. The stone walk just inside the left edge of the doorway was scarred as if a mason had been chipping at it to make a grid of dots. The right edge of the doorway was clad in cedar wood, not stone. Her eyes narrowed, dropping to her haunches. She held out her bowl and reached over the threshold of the room carefully. With a gentle dunt, she pressed the bowl's tip down upon the first wooden board inside the room. With a whoosh, the cedar panels to the right of the doorway suddenly exploded with a movement and a gust of disturbed air. She fell back, snatching the bowl to her chest as a mass hurled across the doorway and crashed against the stone on the left with a metallic clank and a shower of sparks. As she rose, she beheld the contraption, a bed of iron spikes, the full height of the door that would have ripped her apart had she set foot on that floorboard. She stared at the forlorn corpse of Scam Scamandrios and entangled in the spikes. He was more skeleton than flesh, just, a lever just leathery rags of skin dangling from the bones. A spike had pierced his temple, another his neck, and several his chest and limbs. At least it was quick for you, Shadow, she said flatly. The trap was wedged in place and the way into the strong room blocked. She stepped back, vexed, then heard the dull clatter of two guards outside drawing closer to the villa. The sun grows strong. I'll tend to the horses in the stable. You look up the villa, one said to the other. Master will be back tonight, and he'll not be happy if the rooms aren't cool enough for him. A moment later, she heard their footsteps on the lower floor and a steady clunk and click of doors and windows being closed over and locked. No time, Cassandra realized. 
Her breath quickening, she had to get out, but she could not leave without getting the eye. She closed the door to hide the sprung trap, then looked all around the upper landing. No way out into into the strong room, she thought. She thought of the oculus on the ceiling. Perhaps she could climb up onto the roof and drop and drop into the chamber th that way. No, the opening was too too small even for a child to fit through. Her thoughts spun in a thousand different directions until they settled on the first room again. Why would a rich, power-hungry fud like Cyclops ha have a bare room in his villa? She mused, glancing around to confirm that every other part of the place, upstairs at least, was bedecked with trophies and finery. She came before the first room's open door and, and tapped her way into, uh, tapped her way in with her bow. No traps inside. She turned to face the wall shared with the strong room and eyed the shabby doorless cupboard with suspicion. Placing her hands on either side of it, she edged it as quietly as she could to one side and stared at a wooden hatch it revealed. Heart surging with anticipation, she twisted the handle and crawled back into the golden room, racked with suspicion that every moment might bring a hidden a hidden blade, I see what you did there, scathing down upon her or sent her toppling in into a concealed pit of spikes. But there was nothing more. She reached out to pluck the obsidian eye from the plinth, from the plinth, feeling the cold weight of it in her hand, knowing that it would pay off both her troubles and those of Marcos. As she moved back out into the landing and towards the bed chamber and the climb back <coughs> and the climb back down the ivy elation began to swell into a pit of her stomach and then she heard a sigh. Just the bedchamber and that's up and that's the upstairs done. The guard mumbled to himself through the op through the opening in an old leather helm that covered most of his face. She pressed her back to the wall, hugging the shadows, watching as the guard ambled into the bedchambers before she could. She heard a clatter of shutters being closed and a thick clunk of a locking chain. The guard emerged from the chamber again and wandered back downstairs. She paced along behind him like his shadow, creeping down the stairs in time with him to disguise her footsteps, edging up to the main entrance as she did if she, if she looked it while she was still inside. Her stomach twisted as she imagined a fourth head on a marble mantle upstairs. Just then, the guard dropped his keys as he stopped to pick them up. Cassandra took a further step. The boards creaked, the guard bristled, then leaped up and round in one motion. His face curled into a ball field sneer as he swung his axe level, his lips parting the shout for his comrades. The cry never came as Cassandra, in one stroke, grabbed and threw the small knife tucked into the lip of her bracer. It flew straight and pierced the man's throat. He fell, pink foam bubbling from the wound. Cassandra caught his body to reduce the noise. She, she eyed the man for a moment, his keys, his garb, the door, the way to freedom. The watcher stared as the guard ambled from the villa and strolled across the grounds, draped in a black cloak. He heard a few words being exchanged as the guard said something to the other posted at the gateway of the outer walls before the guard continued on out into the countryside. A thrill of anticipation crawled through him. She was everything, everything they hoped she might be. He crammed forward from his vantage point like a crow unblinking. Cassandra heard her own breath crash like waves within the confines of the visored leather helm. Worse, the guard she had killed and taken it from had clearly been um, munching on raw garlic for a year going by the stink. She did all she could to walk in a carefree, almost bored manner, away from the Cyclops' estate, and out uh, and out into the, the brush, patting the flat of a stolen guard axe upon her palm. Her excuse had been simple, I'm going to scout around outside. I'm sure, I'm sure I saw something out there while I was on the villa's top floor. The other sentry at the gate had been too weary from the midday heat to pick up on her questionable attempt at a low gruff voice. She walked into a stand of fit and juniper and felt the shade in there drape across her. Blissful 
blissful invisibility and coolness. The air was spiced with a tang of pine, and the soft carpet of fallen needles felt pleasant to walk on. Up ahead, she saw a clearing with a splash of blue waves beyond. The shore giddiness rose in her in her breast like scented smoke, intoxicating her with the oh-so-close promise of success as she stepped into the clearing. The slow, steady sound of a pair of hands clapping halted her in her stride, sending the fear of, of, the God, of all the gods through her. Excellent, excellent, a voice said. Sandra turned her head towards the figure sitting on a fallen log in a clearing tree line. He was a goal of a man, sporting thin brown hair combed forward, his body swaddled in a pristine white robe streaked with a vivid silver stride, his scrawny neck and wrists dripping with bracelets. A rich man, she realized instantly, and loved his island. The Cyclops of Kevalonia is seldom relieved of his hard-worn treasures, he said, his chest shaking with a chuckle. Cassandra shivered. There was something about his tone, oddly familiar, assuming, and the way he looked at her, his eyes combing her body. It was not a carnal look, but it was desirous and lustful all the same. Rest your hands from your axe. You have nothing to fear from me. Cassandra did not let her gaze waver, refused to blink, and certainly did not set down her stolen axe. Icarus swooped down just then to perch on her shoulder, shrieking at the stranger like a hunter. Shrieking at the stranger. Like a hunter, she took in every scintilla of her peripheral vision. There were no others in the tree line, she realized, but she noticed something else. Downhill at the small inlet, a boat was moored just off the timber jetty. The hideous gorgon head on the sails uh, stared up, stared up at her as crewmen on board hoisted it up to, to the spar. Who are you? She said through clenched teeth. I am Elpenor of Kira. He replied calmly. Kira, Cassandra thought, the gateway to Delphi, the home of the Oracle. She felt a great urge to spit. I came looking for you because I heard great things about you. The mysterious of Kefalonia, Elpenor, continued. You have the wrong person, she growled. There are several mercenaries on this island. None with your skills, Cassandra, he said with the timbre of a tombstone rolling into place. Preternatural speed of mind and body. She reached up to prize the stinking leather helm from her head and tossed it into the nearby grass her hidden braid of hair spilling loose across her chest. What do you want with me? Speak plainly or I'll lodge this axe in your chest. Elpenor laughed, his bony body shaking with amusement. I want to offer you a vast sum of wealth, Cassandra, more than twice the value of that obsidian eye you took from the Cyclops. She moved a hand to her purse, checking the eye was still there. It was, twice as much again. Such riches would allow her to pay off a Cyclops and buy a good home for Phoebe. More, it would break the chains of poverty that kept her on this island. She could go anywhere, do anything. The notion thrilled, filled her. The notion thrilled her with terror and wonder. Then, when she saw how rapaciously eyed her bare arms again, she saw how he rapac, rapaciously eyed her bare arms again. She stiffened and stared down her nose at him. I do not. I do not lie with men for money. Besides, you are old and I might break you. Elpenor crooked an eyebrow. It is not your body I want. Not in that way, at least. I came to offer you a bounty in return for a head. You already have a head of your own, Cassandra sneered. Elpenor half smiled. The head of a warrior, a Spartan general. Cassandra felt the world shift under her feet. They call him the wolf, she said. Cassandra steadied herself, ignoring the streaks of sweat stealing down her back. Generals bleed like all other men, she shrugged. Spartans, too, despite their misplaced consent. So, will you accept the contract? Where is he? Across the sea, in the most converted island in the Greek world. Cassandra's eyes narrowed. She followed his gaze past her shoulders and off to the east. She thought of the haze out at sea. The constant train of Athenian galleys tack tackling, tacking round into the Gulf of Corinthia to bolster the siege of Megaras. He's in Megaras? <coughs> something in my throat. 
Elpenor nodded. In a tug of war between Sparta and Athens, the city of Meg Megara and its narrows and its narrow and its narrow strip of land is the rope. Athens wants the twin ports to complete its naval noose around Hellas. Sparta wants the land to use as a bridge into Attica. Cassandra took a step back and sputtered. So he's inside the Athenian blockade. The wolf and his troops marched over land from Lacona and now he headed for Pag Pagai, M Megaras, Western Port. Why do you want him dead? She asked. The war rages and the wolf is on the wrong side. She shot him a cold look. How do I know you are on the right side? He lifted the fur from his rose and shook it. The thick clunk of drachmi sounded from within because I am the one paying you. Here, he tossed a bag of coins towards her. She plucked it from the air, pleasantly surprised by its weight. Do as I ask, Mysterious, and you shall have ten times this. He smiled in a way that drained all humor from his eyes. She glared at him. I need a boat to run and pierce that blockade. Give me yours and I will accept, she said, flicking her head towards the Gorgon, Gorgon head galley. In truth, she had only w once before been to sea as a Mysterious circling Cephalonia in a rotting old tr trade cog to bring stolen hides to one of Marcos's contracts. My sails cannot be seen in the vicinity when it happens, Mistyos, Elpinos said with an air of finality, but without a boat the contract is void. Athens wore down all of her allies' fleets years ago, forced them to pay into the treasury of the Delian League, League so she could swell on her own navy. There are a few seaworthy galleys left in private hands, and none on Cephalonia. That would be fast enough to cut through a blockade, Elpinor's noise wrinkled. Is it too much for you, Miss Dios? Have I overestimated your skills? When she hesitated to answer, he rose and turned from her, taking a step towards the trees and the track leading downhill towards his boat. Nothing is too much for me, old man, she called after him. You will have the wolf's head in good time. He halted, looking back over his shoulder with hooded, with hooded eyes. Good, come and find me at Pilgrim's Landing in Kira once it is done. Because <coughs> I let the wolf live in my one, but I wonder if Cassandra will kill him in the book. She trekked along the shoreline, heading back towards Marcos' vineyard, or vineyard, whatever you want to call it. The strange Elpinor's parting words danced around in her thoughts, like a falling sacamore seed. Right now, that ore seemed misty and unreal. Kira, she had never been to. The wolf she had never met beyond Cephalonia's coastal waters. She had not ventured, not for twenty years. What a fool, she shied at herself. Why can't you learn to say no to suspect contracts, Marcos and his wretched schemes, and now this death trap of a job? She laughed aloud and the sound surprised her. This wolf is safe. I will never get off this damn island. She trudged on for a time. After a while, she rounded a rocky cape and came to a pale, came to the pale sand of Kleptus Bay. She took her drinking skin from her belt to slate her first, but it never reached her lips. I swear I uttered not a word of a lie, please do not take her from me. But cry sailed across the bay, the voice ragged, ragged and desperate. She fell to her haunches and, haunches and shielded her eyes from the sun. At first she saw just the white foaming, white foaming breakers, wheeling seabirds and a few wild goats chomping on marim grass. It was only a second. It was only on a second sweep that she spotted the trireme lodged on the shoreline, further up the bay, the stern in the sand, and the four bobbing in the water. It was smaller than the Athenian war galleys and Elpinor's gorgon head boat, but it looked slender and well crafted, painted black near the keel and red around the rails. The stern rose into a curving scorpion tail. And the roast rub sported the glittering bronze ram, eyes painted on either side. The Andrastia is everything to me, the voice wailed. And the Andrastia, sorry. Andrastia, Cassandra whispered. No, that's we Barnabas talking. The goddess of retribution and the name of the ship of this ship. Shivers streaked down her back as she cycled the name over and over in her head. 
the Andrastia, the Andrastia sheep mouse clicking, uh, uh, clicking her fingers, unable to recall why the name seemed familiar. There was a movement too, all over the deck, tiny shapes of men, bandits, tying kneeling crew men, beating those who tried to rise. There was one older man bent, uh, bent double, thanks to the giant holding his head, head over a large clay pot. The pied fellow writhed and struggled in vain. She heard the gargles, she heard the gargling, four-lying cry again. God spare me, spare my ship. The cry ended in a frantic gurgle as the giant plunged the wretch's head into the pot. Water and foam spewing from the edges. Now her vision grew eagle sharp and she saw the giant for who he was and realized where she had heard the Andrastia before. Marcos's words echoed in her mind. The Andrastia is one of the last galleys left on the island. The Cyclops is on the hunt and that ship is his prey. Alright, so that's the end of chapter 2 and tomorrow will be chapter 3. Hope you all enjoyed the video and I'll see you in the next one. This is Gamer Junkie, signing off.